Well, that's going to be a tough act to follow. That was like the ultimate diving catch I've seen at a conference ever. Plus, I heard the, you know, I think you were talking about Facebook with that three megabytes of JavaScript. For the record, we need every byte of that to render the home page. Swear. All right. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for coming. My name is Nick Schrock, and I'm an engineer at Facebook. I've been working on GraphQL since its inception three and a half years ago. So yesterday, you heard Lee Byron talk about GraphQL kind of as an <clears throat> overall system. I mean, it's history, it's syntax, it's general functionality. Today, me and my colleague, Dan Schaefer, <clears throat> are going to dive deeper into the system, focusing on a few questions. One, what does it actually mean to design a GraphQL server and the applications built on top of it? And then given this technical preview that we've released, what exactly have you given me? And what do I have to build in order to use and utilize this thing? And three, kind of like, what's the plan from here? So let's start with a simple question. What is a GraphQL server? Because I imagine if I were you out in the audience and just I was introduced to the system, I'd be kind of like, yeah, I see these pretty strings, but what you've given to me is not actually a working server, really. And what is this thing? So I think a good place to start, actually, is what it isn't. And Lee touched on this yesterday, but I think it's incredibly important. And it, like, if there's one takeaway here, is that GraphQL does not mandate a specific language backend, and it does not mandate a specific storage engine. What it is is an application server that conforms to the specification that we released yesterday. And it can be built on any language, and under any storage engine, uh, well, not under it, uh, on any storage engine. <coughs> and it's all about a standardized type system and a standardized API. So very concretely, a GraphQL engine exposes a single, uh, pardon me, a GraphQL server exposes a single endpoint. That endpoint parses and executes a query. That query executes over a type system that's defined in the application server. And Last but not least, that type system is available via introspection, via actually a GraphQL API, which still gets me tickled pink that we you know, built the system on itself. That is the ultimate nerd catnip. Um, so how is the GraphQL server structured? So we think about it in terms of three major components. One, the one on the left, is the GraphQL core. So what we released yesterday in the technical preview is effectively the GraphQL core written in JavaScript. Um, on the right is your either existing business logic or the business logic you have yet to write. And the middle is kind of one of the more interesting parts of the system, the type definitions. We try to keep those as thin as possible, but this is the layer that actually maps your application code to that internalized type system. And again, I think that might be the most magical part <coughs> without having seen it first, and hopefully we can dig into it. But first, let's cover the per-language GraphQL core. Um, it consists of five major components. Uh, first is the front end. So <coughs> this is a pretty standard compiler front end, meaning it's a lexer and parser, <coughs> pardon me, that uh, changes a query text to an in-memory AST, abstract, abstract syntax tree. So one of the reasons why we divide this into this component is one, is this kind of like a well-known computer science problem. It's easily, you know, it's easily defined component. But maybe more importantly, the core that we're talking about is not just useful for a server. It's also useful, useful for tools. So for example, Relay, as you know, definitely uses <coughs> the parser to understand, to process, this, um, process the GraphQL that's embedded within it and have it in memory so it can process it. Uh, many, many tools will use that system in order to semantically manipulate GraphQL. Uh, next is the type system. So by the type system, we mean the core provides APIs to you, the server developer, in order for you to define your type definitions. <coughs> so this is that layer again, right? The thin mapping layer that maps your applications, your application logic to the GraphQL type domain. So this is what it looks like. This is kind of example code from our SDK. The GraphQL object type is actually a class that's provided to you uh, by the JS core. So this defines a type which is externally available by the system. And so there's a couple of interesting things here. One, 
the left side of this actually defines kind of the external graph API, uh, pardon me, GraphQL API uh, for this user type. So we defined a user type. On this user type, we can query three different fields, ID, name, and pick, and they have three different types. On the right-hand side is the application code. And note that it maps to arbitrary code. So the first two are trivial. They just map to properties. But the third one actually maps to a function, which can poke at configuration, you know, construct a CDN URL, and then return it to the user. And we'll dig in more into that later. Next, there's introspection. So this is a GraphQL API for querying types. So once you define one of these type definitions and kind of provide it to the server, then you can actually query the types using GraphQL itself. Uh, so for example, here's an introspection query. Uh, and any, any GraphQL server will get these queries out of the box just by using a, a GraphQL core. Uh, so we can query for a type. Uh, double underscores are prefixed, so it doesn't collide with any types defined in so-called user space. Uh, and then we're querying the fields and the name and the type on each of those fields. And the result is pretty straightforward. Anyway, we get a type. Its name is user. It has a few fields. I've elided the ID and name one. But we have the one pick one, and its type name is picture. So one of the interesting things about introspection <clears throat> is that we can put other information in it. So for example, we put documentation in it. And we also put deprecation information into the, types, into the introspection system. So for example, we could query all the fields and understand their description and whether or not they're deprecated. So why is this useful? So typically, in most APIs that I know of, um, you often define the API and then either out of band in a CMS content management system, or you rely on someone else to document it, or maybe you hand roll some tools to like extract, uh, extract the documentation out of code. So with description, you can actually co-locate your documentation with the mapping file. So ideally, you know, we all keep up-to-date up documentation at all times, of course, but uh, as you alter the application code that you map a specific field to, you can also update the description. And then automatically, that description is flowed out of all the tools that rely on your introspection system. So for example, at Facebook, we have a documentation browser that literally queries the GraphQL server and then produces documentation. The moment you update your descriptions, that documentation browser is automatically updated. We also have deprecation. So you can signal to your client developers that this field is deprecated and is deprecated for such and such a reason. And that actually has some implications. One, you can communicate the client tooling. Imagine you had integration with an IDE. Little red squigglies could come up and really warn the users. And we also don't return these fields by default in the introspection query. Next is validation. And that answers the question, is a query valid within an app schema? So again, this is always useful to illustrate by example. Let's say we did a, <coughs> a query for our friends and we ordered by some string. Well, actually, this takes an enumeration, so that's incorrect. And then we try to fix it. We keep the misspelling there. That's an invalid en enum value. And finally, we actually fix it. Validation is another chunk of code that will be extremely useful to client tooling. So for example, again in Relay, Relay will be able to communicate before you even check in their code uh, to ensure that the queries are valid within the current type system and give you a very meaningful error, error message. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Lastly, we have execution. And this is one of the more interesting parts of the system. So this manages query execution, basically the process of walking the abstract syntax tree, keeping the type system in context, and then calling back into that application code that you define in the type definitions. And one of my favorite parts about this execution engine and GraphQL in general <coughs> is that this really exploits the parallelism that is inherent in every single GraphQL query. So what do I mean by that? So say in this query, we have pick and friends, and we actually, that has some fan out, right? And because those are backed by arbitrary code, you can imagine just executing those at the same time, right? Because they're completely independent of each other. Um, and so let's visualize this. So starting with the executor, we start at this root field called me. Keep the query in your head. And so this maps <coughs> to this GraphQL type definition. And here we go. 
and we just get the logged in user and return it to the executor. Now, one of the useful things about the executor is it is the thing that manages the process of taking these objects that we return out of the type definition and threading them to the other type definitions that are relevant. So for example, we, we, we route that user that we got out of the logged in user to this, uh, this other user definition file. And if you look at these user arguments, this is exactly the object that we returned out of the previous thing. Right, so this is a really useful mechanism. But let's go back to the parallelism issue. How do we actually exploit the parallelism that's implicit in the fact that we could do pick and user, <coughs> pick and friends at the same time? And that's that resolve can return a promise. And the promise is returned to the executor, <coughs> and the executor knows how to deal with it. And it actually does a lot of work. You know, in the end of the day, it calls promise.all on both of these promises. But by managing all of this, you can kind of write your code in terms of these individual field functions, and then the, the executor takes, a, takes care of the ton of, of the parallelism for you. And so let's imagine we're at this point in the query, and we've returned pick, and we've returned a set of the users. And now each one of those users also needs a profile pick. So this again, rely, <clears throat> this falls back on the executor. So we get back n users, the executor calls this function pick resolve n times, we get n promises. It resolves all those promises, gets an object back, and throws it back to this other resolve function at the bottom. And this is a really, really powerful mechanism for kind of getting massive parallelization out of your system. This is the way our PHP implementation does in, um, at Facebook as well. You know, this, it exploits this natural parallelism in the fields. So the technical preview, as I said, is a JS implementation of our core. And again, that's the front end. It's a type system. It's the introspection system that queries that type system using GraphQL itself, which again, makes us really happy. Uh, validation, which validates that the query is valid within a specific type system. And the execution engine. So what does it all mean? Um, and what I mean by that is like, where do we go from here? Um, and really, you know, the reason why we release this so early, I mean, this is very early on in the process. Like, again, we don't have a working back end. You know, we are working on one actually on top of parse. But, you know, why did we release this so early? And the reason why is, is this project is only going to be successful is that it turns into an ecosystem. And we really need other engineers' help in order to really make it where it can apply to a broad base of applications. So what do I mean by ecosystem here? <clears throat> so at the core of this ecosystem is the idea of GraphQL and the API and its requirements. And that is encoded in the specification. That's the core of the ecosystem. But on top of that, we have the GraphQL core that is per language. So we released a JS one today. You know, we imagine there'll be a Ruby one, Python one, God forbid there might be a Visual Basic one. I mean, who knows? On top of that, we imagine a lot of supporting libraries. So a lot of you who program on top of SQL backends are kind of like, oh my God, this is gonna be very difficult to actually generate efficient SQL queries. And in order to make this successful, we're gonna need to build a library that actually translates complex GraphQL queries into reasonably chunky SQL queries that can actually utilize the database efficiently. And on top of that, we have the universe of application servers that we want to be built on top of it. <coughs> but there's also other systems that can be built on top of the spec. So for example, we have common tools um, that hopefully could execute against any generic GraphQL server. One example of it is a, is a tool we call Graphical. Uh, this is an IDE-like tool that is used to construct queries. Um, it's actually, you know, we're working on releasing it as soon as possible, um, but it's an extremely powerful tool. All of our developers at Facebook who interact with GraphQL use this tool probably every single day. Next, you have client SDKs, right? For example, the one you're most familiar with is Relay, right? But there could be one on iOS, and in fact, there should be one on iOS, and I think there will be one, uh, as well as Android. And then we have the universe of GraphQL clients. And you know, what we really want to start here is this virtual, virtuous cycle, where we bootstrap the system, building useful tools and backends, 
but we also have other people, early adopters, who want to take the risk and really believe in it in order to build additional backends and tools. And then people will start building application servers and client code bases on top of this. And then that will exert downward and upward pressure on this ecosystem so we get higher quality libraries and higher quality tools. And then more people will build application servers and client, server and client code bases. And on and on and on it goes. Right? This is kind of the magic of a software abstraction, if it actually is a good idea. And that's really the virtuous cycle we want to kick off here. And then, why do this at all? And I guess the core belief is that this is a strong value proposition for everyone involved. We think it's a fundamentally better way to structure mobile apps and client apps in general. And one of the things we need to get right is how to structure the app server and the APIs around it. And with that, that is what Dan's going to talk about. So. Thanks. So as Nick mentioned, GraphQL doesn't require you to change anything about your storage backend. And it doesn't require you to change a lot about your data model. But it is a fundamentally different way of thinking about APIs. And while we could take our existing APIs that we've built using various mechanisms, uh, perhaps a REST-like style or custom endpoints, and basically translate them wholesale into GraphQL, in doing so, we wouldn't actually take advantage of the value proposition that GraphQL brings and the increased abilities and the increased power that a GraphQL API allows us to use. So let's start with an example API that we might design in sort of a RESTful style and then translate it into GraphQL and see sort of what additional abilities we get from that. So let's take a concrete example. Uh, we'll try building out an API to power a post on Facebook. Uh, I'm delighted to say Lee was very pleased with the breakfast of options this morning. <laughs> so we'll just cover this part of the actual permalink for now in order to simplify things. But if we're trying to build out this API, you can imagine that in a REST-like API, and there's no strict definition for what REST means, but we would probably identify a post as a resource. And we're going to issue a GET request to some URL in order to fetch data about that resource, and it's going to turn some payload. I'll have it be in JSON for convenience. And that payload will contain a message, it'll contain a timestamp, and then it will contain some identifier to another resource in the system, in this case, a user. And in this example, I chose a user ID. You might imagine it would be a URL instead. But either way, we're going to fetch that other resource by issuing another GET request, and we're going to get our payload back. We're going to get an ID, a name, and a profile picture. So if this is what our REST API looks like, we could, if we wanted to, build a GraphQL API that did the same thing. We would, instead of having a GET request to a particular URL, have one of these root fields that we've described that takes in an ID and then returns this object, and we would fetch the, pay the fields on it. And then similarly, we'd have a user root field that matches the post root field, and that would allow us to fetch data about the user. So in doing so, we can basically reproduce our REST API in GraphQL. But I don't think we would. If all we've done is translated exactly what we could do before in our API into a new API, we haven't really gained anything. But I think in looking at this API, it does have some issues, and has issues that GraphQL can help us correct. First, if we just look at the queries, we fetch this author ID, or potentially an author URL, and then we just sort of had to know what to do with it. We had to know that this particular URL was going to return certain data, or if it is an ID, we have to know that it's a user ID and not some other ID in the system. So the query is a requires a little bit of implicit knowledge to use. And if we just look at the responses that we got back from the server, I don't actually think these are the responses we'd want to get back if we were powering this view. I don't think if I was building this view, I would say I want to do one round trip to the server in order to fetch the message and the timestamp, and then I want to do a second round trip to the server in order to fetch the name and the profile picture. I would want my payload to look like this. Get me the message, get me the timestamp, get me the name, get me the profile picture, and let me render this. And so in theory in GraphQL, we can do this with nested queries. But if we look at the API that we built out where we just copied it wholesale from REST, we actually can't. There's a slight impedance mismatch here. In the REST API that we sort of modeled this after, we returned some identifier for a resource, either an ID or a URL. But what we want in our GraphQL payload, what we want in the response, is the object itself. And this is where GraphQL's nested queries come in. If we subtly change the API, if instead of returning an author ID or an author URL, we return the author object itself, now we can include this nested field set, say exactly what data we want, 
and get the response that we're looking for. So this has solved our problem with the response. Now we have one request to the server, one payload that contains exactly the data we need. That's a huge win already for the user. We're not doing two round trips. But for the developer experience, we've also gained. Because no longer do we have the sort of magic author ID field that we don't really know what to do with. Now we have an author field. And as Nick mentioned, we can introspect on this. We can look at the author field in tooling and say, this is going to return a user object, and it's going to have these fields available on it. So from a developer experience perspective, we've made this query easier to use. We've made this API easier to use. And we've provided our users with a faster loading time because we're no longer doing two round trips. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so if we look at another approach to designing APIs, you could, instead of doing REST endpoints, just do custom endpoints. For any particular feature, we will just have an endpoint that returns the data that we need. And this works well. And we can, again, duplicate this in GraphQL. But by using the type system in GraphQL, we find that what used to be custom endpoints end up being a lot more powerful and a lot more reusable. And often, you don't even need to write them. I'll get to that in a second. So again, let's take a real product that we're trying to build. In this case, we're trying to build out a friend list. And it's pretty simple data. It's got uh, the user's ID, the user's name, and then uh, some recent activity of the user. In this case, Alex just became friends with someone. Ola is in Vegas. So we're going to have a data payload that just returns blobs of JSON there. And then if we were building out this product as well, people in this conversation, again, we can easily build out a custom endpoint to serve this particular view. We're going to just have a return an array of data, each of which is a JSON blob. The JSON blob here is going to have the ID, the name, and in this case, mutual friends. So we can display that 162 mutual friend string. So two custom endpoints. They're just returning JSON blobs. We could build out sort of GraphQL clones of these custom endpoints if we wanted to. But before we do so, let's take a step back and think about what we're really building when we build out these APIs. When we're building out custom endpoints, we have these two features on the client. And we know we need to send data down to them. And so we're going to build out an endpoint for each of them. And building these endpoints is actually fairly straightforward. Because we just think, what data do we need to send to the client? Cool. Make a custom endpoint that fetches that data and send it down. When we're building the equivalent in GraphQL, though, there's not one endpoint per feature. There's just sort of GraphQL on the server. So what is it that we're building when we say we're going to build an API to support these features if we're not building endpoints and we're not building resources? What we're building out is the GraphQL type system. The GraphQL type system, as Lee and Nick both described, is what describes the capabilities of a GraphQL server. It lists the possibilities for the client. It says what queries they can issue. And so if we're building something out to support a feature, we need to say, these are the capabilities that you need, and these are the capabilities that we support. So if we look at this example, which I am now behind in slides, and we're trying to build out the capabilities, then we're going to look at this top one. We're going to say, what capability does this feature need? And it's a simple one. It needs to be able to query for my list of friends. And a list of friends is going to return a list of users. It's pretty straightforward. This is the capability in the type system we want to expose. What query do we need to support for the people in this conversation view in order to power this one? Well, it needs to get a list of the people in this conversation. It's pretty straightforward. But that also returns a list of users. And this is a key observation in the GraphQL type system. When we were building out custom endpoints, we had one developer working on this friend list and one developer working on this messaging view and the list of people in conversation. And they were just building completely separate endpoints. They probably weren't working together, weren't talking together. One of them's building one endpoint, one's building the other. But in our storage layer, these are certainly th the same users. And probably in our data model, they're the same users too. And ideally, in our front end, in whatever data storage we're using in the client, they're the same user because we want consistency between these views. If Nick Schrock changes his profile picture in one, we don't want the old one to appear in the other. So if these are the same types all throughout the system, why would we want them to be different in our API? And in GraphQL, they wouldn't be. We'd define a user type, and it would be used in both of these capabilities. So let's do so. Let's define that user type. Well, if we're defining GraphQL API, we're defining capabilities again. And we know exactly what capabilities we need here. We need an ID. We need a name. We need a recent update for that friends view. And we need a mutual friend count. And notice we haven't really described what the queries for these two are going to be. But because we just defined the list of capabilities they need, the queries fall out. That first one, the query is just query for friends, get the ID, name, and recent update. For the second one, get the users in conversation, the ID, name, and mutual friend count. So what did this buy us? 
Like we just translated, okay, instead of loading out custom endpoints that power data, we'll build out a type system instead. Why? And I think the, when this really comes into play is when we introduce one additional element of complexity into our system. And it's an element of complexity that we're all familiar with, which is the client is never done. We're always building new features. We're always iterating on existing features. And as soon as we do so, that's where the GraphQL approach shines. Because we take this diagram, which is really nice and easy to read now, very simple, and then we say, okay, cool, we're iterating on the client, we're adding two new features. Okay, now we just add two new endpoints, I guess. Now we double the number of features again. And suddenly on the server, we have a host of endpoints that we have to manage, that we have to maintain, all of which are coupled to the client. And the fact that they're coupled to the client becomes an issue when we do one other type of iteration, which is instead of introducing new features, we iterate on old ones. We build feature 1.1 at some slight change. The endpoint needs to return you know, some data it wasn't before. We no longer need some data it was sending after that. Now, if we're just building purely software on the web where we can immediately update our clients, that's great. We'll just issue a new endpoint. But if you're building iOS software or Android software or hopefully soon React Native software, well, we can't necessarily get rid of those old endpoints because we shipped an app to our users that had those old features, that required that, new, that old data. So instead of having two endpoints on the server now, now we have an endpoint per feature per version. And we're not done iterating on these clients. We're going to keep building out new versions and new versions until eventually our previously pretty and easy to understand server diagram looks a little bit like the end screen from Windows Solitaire. <laughs> so how does GraphQL fix this? Well, we don't need an endpoint per feature in GraphQL. There is just GraphQL on the server and the type system. And so when we introduce a new feature, or when we iterate on an old feature, we don't need to duplicate anything on the server. We don't need to have GraphQL you know, version 1 point whatever. If a new capability is needed, we just add that to the same GraphQL system. So let's take a look at this in action. Let's actually change what this product would do. Right now, if we zoom in, it's showing the number of mutual friends for the people in this view. Uh, let's change it and show, say, their most recent work experience they have on their profile instead. Okay. So we have our old client, and it was issuing this query, and it's no longer valid because that's not the data we want to fetch. Well, most of it's still the same. We're still going to fetch users in conversation, get the ID, and get the name. But now instead of fetching mutual friend count, we're going to fetch, say, work description instead. And now there are two possibilities. The less likely one is that capability doesn't exist, and we're going to have to go at it on the server. The more likely one is we're working on this messaging product, but somebody on the profile team or somebody on some other team has already wanted to display this work description, they've already added it to the type system. They've already exposed this capability for user. And so we don't actually have to touch the server at all to make this iteration on the product. We're just using a capability that already exists, and we update our client, and it works seamlessly. So when we iterate on our features, we're not building a new thing on the server. At best, we're actually not changing the server at all, and at worst, we're just adding some additional capability, which doesn't break our old clients. It just adds new capabilities for the new ones. This is a huge structural advantage. This one that we've seen as we've used GraphQL over time at Facebook is a massive usability win. Because an object like user in the Facebook system, especially since it's been used in iOS and Android for years, a lot of the capabilities, if not all the capabilities you would need, are already built out. So if you're building out a new product that has a user in it, you probably never have to touch that type. It's all there for you. So yesterday, Lee described what GraphQL is. He introduced it and explained why it's powerful. Just now, Nick explains how GraphQL works as an API layer atop existing server-side storage and data models and the ecosystem that we hope will emerge. And I explained how GraphQL APIs differ from existing APIs and why we think it's a more powerful model, both from a user experience and a developer experience perspective. When we first talked about GraphQL at ReactJSConf in January, the reaction that we got from the community was tremendous. We had developers looking at the slides and looking at the blog posts and using that in order to implement uh, you know, GraphQL implementation in various languages. It was tremendous. Uh, it was really exciting to release the spec and the JS implementation yesterday. Again, we weren't really sure what the reaction was. Uh, I don't actually know how GitHub stars work. I'm told this is good. The reaction has been <laughs> phenomenal. Um, we're really excited to start building out this ecosystem. If you're interested in building out tooling around GraphQL, if you're interested in building out GraphQL core in various languages or top backends, please get in touch with us on GitHub, on Twitter. Pick your favorite way of getting in touch with people on the internet. We'll be on there. We really look forward to working with you. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. And I think we're almost running over, so I don't think we have time for questions, but Nick and I will both be around and are happy to chat with anyone.